question. Um, Libby. Thank you, Libby. Um, and um, first of all, just to let you know, unfortunately, Phil from Sussex Surplus is ill, so he isn't actually able to come and do his presentation today. So on our um, bottle it, juice it, <laughs> dry it. Unfortunately, bottle it isn't with us. Um, but he has said that he will share his presentation notes. I'm sorry, slides with, the, with us afterwards. And um, if anybody does want to follow up, particularly to talk about that part of the process, um, in, we can arrange for that to happen. Um, for those of you who are interested, it basically he uses an autoclave machine in order to be able to actually um, pasteurize and extend the life of the soups that he makes and they go into a bottle. But as I say, we will be able to share that um, with people afterwards. Um, so I'm Vic from the Brighton and Hove Food Partnership, um, and I'm going to get um, Nick and Bryn to quickly say hello as the people from the Permaculture Trust. Hello, everybody. I'm Nick. Hello. Hello, I'm Bryn. Great. Those are working. Um, I've also got with me here today Libby from the Brighton and Hove Food Partnership, because um, Libby has actually been working with me on the dehydration project that we've been doing and is the person who's actually been in the kitchen chopping up the vegetables and using the machine whereas I'm more of the oversight as to why we do it so if you've got slightly more like specific questions later I will bring Libby in for those but she'll also be keeping her eye on the chat so if you want to put things in the chat while well, we've done this as a you know just as a regular zoom meeting which means everybody can speak everyone can contribute it's not like just the speakers um it does mean you need to be really disciplined on keeping your microphones off um otherwise we'll get a lot of background noise but also if you've got things that you want to put in the chat questions you know comments to each other please use that as well um the format for the day is going to be um, Jade's going to do a very brief introduction to what the Ready Healthy Eat um, project is all about, which is why we're putting on this webinar. Then Bryn and Nick are going to talk about the Permaculture Trust um, juicing project. I will do the dehydration, and then we're going to do questions and discussion at the end. So I'm going to kind of get the speakers to keep going with momentum so we've got plenty of time for discussions. As I said, with one less speaker, we might actually finish a little bit earlier, in which case I'll give you all the gift of time and you can go home and do something else instead. <laughs> um, so first of all, Jade, over to you, really, if you'd just quickly like to explain a little bit about the overall programme. Yeah, hi, I'm Jade, Jade Bashford. I work for the Real Farming Trust. So this piece of work has arisen out of a bigger piece of work called Ready Healthy, which was a lottery funded, community fund funded piece of work around uh, ready meals to address um, food insecurity and food injustice. Um, so Brighton Hay Food Partnership were one of the partners. Um, so were Edinburgh, Cyrenians and, and two others, really fantastic partners. They did all the interesting work and can take all the credit for doing all the good stuff on the ground. One of the things we wanted to get out of it, you know, we're the national partner with this sort of systems change view at the top of it all, was to observe what um, what needed to change on a bigger scale, what the innovations were, where the bottlenecks were. Um, there was a university research project attached to it done by Coventry University to measure social impact. So we were observing how the delivery partners did the work, what they had in common, what was different, what the common problems were, what the underlying bottlenecks were. So, of course, a lot of that was to do with surplus food and surplus food networks um, and nutrition that came through those, um, what was happening to vegetables who didn't have storage, um, how people were using food at the other end according to their processing um, capacities at home or on whatever community projects they're in. So they, we thought this was very interesting, what Brighton Hove Food Partnership started doing about dehydration, because we could see um, that some of the surplus food networks were quite were struggling to manage random amounts of veg when they came. And consequently, people were not getting as much fruit and veg as they should have done at the other end of the system because there were um, difficulties in sur surplus food supply chains of what to do when there were too much, when there was too much veg at different times. Um, so we asked Vic to um, share what she'd done. Um, one of the things we're interested in, you might think about it as you go along, is not only whether it's a good thing to do, um, but also at what point in the supply chain it's a good thing to do. So, for example, I'm wondering whether it's better done on a bigger scale, um, higher up at the fair share level, or whether it's better done um, nearer the ground, uh, where you've got more people who might want to get involved, hands-on with Chop and Chat. 
Um, but at the top of the supply chain, of course, you know what's actually a surplus, which none of the community groups can use, and you can maybe dehydrate more efficiently. So I, I just keep that in your mind, I guess, as uh, as Rick speaking. Anyway, uh, so thank you, Rick, for um, being a marvellous partner and for sharing what you know. Really helpful. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Jade. And whilst uh, Ready Healthy Eat had asked the Food Partnership, Brighton and Hope Food Partnership, I've got loads of food partnerships on the screen now. I have to be really careful that I don't do my the Food Partnership. Um, <laughs> but is that um, about the dehydration project, which we did parts Ready Healthy Eat, I actually thought it was quite interesting to try and have a bit of a spotlight on some of the micro processing that's been going on in Brighton and Hove. Um, the Brighton Permaculture Trust has been for many years now, I think it was 2008 we started working with you on the scrumping project, has actually been um, processing fruit from around the city. And as I said, for those of you who arrived a bit late, unfortunately, Phil from Sussex Surplus is actually sick today, so isn't here to talk about his soup making project, although we will share the slides afterwards. They have been, they are associated with the Gleaning Network, and so they are processing quantities of pumpkins and courgettes into us into a long life soup that is actually as jade mentions at the farm level so that's quite that's sort of a slightly different model but i will now pass over to nick and Bryn, who can do a introduction to what there's been going on with the scrumping project thanks vic yes i'm Bryn thomas the director and one of the founders of brighton permaculture trust um so we started the scrumping project. It was actually autumn 2009 when we actually uh, 2000, when we actually went out and um, picked our first fruit, Vic. Um, we picked 500 kilos of fruit in that first year, and that's now risen to an average of 30 tonnes per year in recent years that we've picked or processed. Um, so the project got off the ground thanks to some lottery local food funding that the Brighton Hope Food Partnership um, secured um, at a startup funding for the first few years. Um, so Nick will talk in a second about what we actually achieve now. Um, in a specific point that uh, that you raised, though, um, we were aware the the, res the start of the project was a response to the fact we were aware of a lot of fruits that was simply dropping from trees and going to waste. So uh, for um, um, that fruit never entered the supply chain. So this is pre-supply uh, chain stuff that large national bodies wouldn't be aware of. So Nick, what's our present situation? Hmm. Um, let me just, well, I'll introduce myself first. I, I'm Nick, I head up the Scrumping Project with the with the Brighton Permaculture Trust. Um, and uh, it's my pleasure to take you for a little tour of our um, processing methods. So just bear with me. Okay, are you all with me on the presentation? Cool. Um, so before we can actually start to process any of the fruit that we um, uh, turn it and make anything into juice, we have to source it. And so we have multiple different um, sources. So we have a our, our own orchard or two on site at Stammer Park, which for those of you who don't know, Stammer Park is just on the edge of the city of Brighton, um, and it's actually it's probably about eight hundred acres or so of of council land um, that used to be a private estate, and there's multiple different operations there. Um, anything from a kind of botanical garden esque thing to tea rooms to private houses, um, but generally it's a public it's a public space. So uh, we also have planted. Um, multiple different community orchards in and uh, in and around the city and sort of Sussex wide uh, and visit private orchards dotted around the county where people are generous enough that they let us come in and collect any fruit that they don't personally need or want. Um, we also have a very good relationship with a wholesaler uh, where we take all of his wonky veg. So it's not up to supermarket grade. Oh, bear with me. Let me just 
that's the it's skipping ahead a little bit. Um, so these could be wrong color, wrong shape, one wrong size, um, but otherwise are all good. So we do all of our processing at our fruit factory, which is this building here. Um, it's an old agricultural building that we have repurposed. And essentially inside it's similar to a commercial kitchen. So stainless steel worktops, sinks. It's quite basic, um, but it um, suits all the hygiene needs and things. So we start our processing outside um, by giving the apples a good old wash and filtering the the, the rotten ones or mouldy ones get discarded into compost. The next grade of fruit that might be slightly bruised or blemished um, goes into our cider. And then the higher grade fruit goes to juicing. So we do this part of the process outside um, so that we can engage with uh, the public as they wander by and help to spread the word of the charity and our aims, but also more specifically the, the issues surrounding food waste. So the actual process is uh, starts by passing the apples through the tall yellow machine, which effectively is a, is a blender. Um, the apples come out the bottom chopped up. We'll then pass them into the press, which is uh, has the orange lid there and steel drum. Um, this is a hydro press. So basically inside of the press, there's a, uh, a water balloon. Um, and after we filled it and screwed on the lid, we pump water into the balloon. And as it expands, it forces the, the, the pulped apple to the edge of the drum and therefore extracts the juice. Uh, which falls down into buckets. We then take the buckets and pour them into large tanks inside. This was me yesterday on a juicing mission. Um, so we store the juice overnight in large sort of 200 litre tanks where we let the sediment slowly filter to the bottom before bottling the next day. This does throw up some issues for us at our scale um because we must keep the temperature of the juice cool otherwise it will start to ferment which for cider that's absolutely fine but for juice it it spoils it basically um so our very technical methods of this are we freeze blocks of apple juice in ice cream tubs and then throughout the day um and before the night we prop those blocks of apple frozen apple juice into the tanks to help keep it cool so then the next day we'll come in and uh, we'll start by washing and sterilizing all of the bottles. Um, so that is a really important process in the, in the whole thing, whether we're outside, inside, everything must be very sterile and, and clean. Um, so after the bottles have been filled, we then pop them into this, the uh, pasteurizer here, which basically is a, a bath, a bath of hot water. So the bottles will sit in a bath of hot water at 75 degrees and be kept at that temperature for half an hour. That process kills off any of the bacteria um, that might be present, but more importantly, any yeasts, um, because yeasts react with sugars and that's what creates fermentation. Um, and if you don't prevent that, then the bottles will, well, they'll explode basically. Um, but basically, this part of the process takes us from having a three day shelf life as a fresh raw product to 18 months. Once the bottles have been pasteurized, we'll then take them out, let them cool overnight, and then we'll uh, label them. So we do all our labeling in house. So we design and print and put them all on quite painstakingly. So by hand. Um, and have to make sure all the legalities are met, such as best before dates, allergens, if there's any alcohol present, um, and batching, so that if there aren't any issues, we can trace it back. After we've bottled it, we um, we obviously have to sell it. So we do this by, at the front of our fruit factory at weekends, whilst we're pressing, we have a little market stall. Um, we also, host several events across the year 
that are um, opportunities for the public to come and get a bit of an insight into what we're doing um, and celebrate all things apples and, you know, have some music and some dancing and um, and set up a stall again and hope to make some make some good sales. Other outlets that we have are some local shops and cafes, um, which is an area that we're looking to expand into a little bit more this year. Um, however, the big challenge there is trying to be um, financially competitive. Uh, effectively, there's other producers in the area that um, due to their facilities and methods, they can basically make the same product as we can, but at quite a bit of a less cost to them. So we're trying to be a little bit more competitive in our in our methods um, and um, go from there. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Um, appreciate that. And I guess um, before I go into my presentation, I suppose one of the things that really strikes me in terms of, you know, Ian's made a thing about this sort of scale question. Um, I think that also that becomes very much in this whole what you do with volunteer time, um, how much of it is an activity which is about social connections. Um, I mean, I sort of, I know, because I know that, for example, some of your regular team of volunteers come up and do all of that bottling and labelling with you, and it's quite an important part for them. It Definitely. isn't the most efficient, necessarily, if you're looking at cost only way of doing it, but there's obviously the social connections there. So I'm actually now going to use my, I'm going to change my hats and go from being chairing this to presenting, and then we'll have a chance for some questions afterwards. So I just need a moment while I share my screen. As I said to the others earlier, this will now not work. Um, <laughs> Right, here we go. Um, so, um, as Jade has already mentioned, the this um, microprocessing dehydration project for us very much was part of our Ready Healthy Eat um, project, which was um, something we've been working on over the last couple of years. Um, for those of you that don't know, the Brighton and Hove Food Partnership is a not-for-profit organisation based in Brighton and Hove, which is on the south coast of England, because I think there might be a couple of people here from outside the UK. Um, and we work on multiple levels um, with individuals, with groups, with caterers and food businesses, and it's just strategy and policy level. We also try to come up with some innovations and ideas and test things and share what we learn to see how um, we can come up with some good ideas, especially around community food. One of the things we run is something called the Surplus Food Network, which brings together um, a number of organisations in the city involved in surplus food redistribution. So it's a fair share, it's a real junk food project, there's the Gleaning Network, um, and then there's some other really small groups that are involved. And, you know, like most places across the UK, a huge amount of this food is going into, like, emergency food provision, it's going into meals, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot happening. Um, but I suppose where some of this project initially developed from was this idea that there is often surplus doesn't arrive in its nice, easy, this is how much we want each week. There's what we sometimes call the surplus surplus. It's the sudden glut of when you're there in the summer and you could surround yourself with courgettes that are all a bit short date and you need to do something with them quite quick. Um, as I say, Jade's already... project we had quite a sort of strong feeling of going improving access to fresh produce isn't only about the availability of that produce if you don't have the means to store it or to cook it even if you access it you can't benefit from it you don't get the nutrients from it and for us this was happening at the same time as there was a pandemic and a cost of living crisis which meant that people were switching off their fridges they don't have storage space they are really really limited on what they're cooking so we were trying to rethink meals in the concept of this, of trying to overcome some of these barriers. Um, so the fresh surplus projects that flood projects at certain times of year, and we sort of started about going, okay, what can we do to do something with these? And it's a blooming long list, isn't it, when you start to think about all of the different things that are there, but we sort of looked within our local data, so the information we got from our, our surplus food projects about what we call were the main culprits. 
um, potatoes, bread, milk, tomatoes, courgettes. And then there were those things at certain times of year, you know, Swedes the side of your head or pumpkins that come in massive, massive truckloads that nobody really wants to be able to deal with. Um, we also did have some discussion about high value protein items such as meat, milk, um, meat and fish or pulses. And we haven't addressed this yet, but I'm putting this out there because I think a lot of what gets processed doesn't necessarily meet protein needs when you're thinking about nutrition. Um, and we actually did a sort of facilitated workshop where we basically sat around and we had discussions and ideas around what are the different ways you can process and what can you do with things. So these are some of the best, you know, these are some of the processes for extending shelf life. Um, and um, depending on your product, obviously different ones work or don't work in different ways. And I would guess I would say to everybody who's interested in this, it's almost worth stepping back going, what do we have lots of? Um, what is our problem item? And then looking back at some of the more traditional ways or some of the techniques other countries use for dealing with that product. Because going back to what Nick and Bryn were talking about, apples are a real thing in Sussex. We've got so many apple trees that they were looking, they were starting with the produce that they had. Um, so the, the Ready Healthy Eat project actually also happened to start in February 2020, which was a very strange time to start a project. But we, so we were doing a lot of this kind of in our own spaces, in our own ways. Um, and I suppose the fact that the surplus itself is problematic. Um, we, when we knew emergency food provision was increasing. Um, we had our first iteration of a solution to a problem, which is actually based on a memory of an Italian dried veg, veg product that I had seen in a pack and was a bit like, I remember you used to be able to buy those really fancy courgettes and tomatoes that had been dried, right? And that sort of started it, this conversation of going, could we make a dehydrated veg pack? So the process of testing and refining it um, was, a, was a real trial and error thing for us because people have done dehydration, but either at massive scale or at domestic scale. And we were sort of trying to operate in this funny little in-between space. Um, and we had we invested in a dehydrator. I'll come on to the kit in a minute, which is, it's about the size of a small fridge is the best way I can describe it to you in terms of what it looks like. Okay, so it's not the single desk one, size one that you have at home where you can, you know, play around with things, but it's not what you would get if you were in a great big warehouse where it would be banks and banks of them. Um, and we, we did some testing and refining. Um, large parts of this involved really looking at what all the food safety processes were, needing to do product tests, um, our HACCP, insurance, and all of these sort of parts of the project. We have got a guide that we're writing, which um, when I get to the end, I'll tell you how you can get a copy of. We're putting all this information in there so you can just copy it if you want to. Um, because nutrition was really important for us, we also work with a nutritionist to understand how nutritional value is maintained. For those of you particularly interested in that element, if it is a, because you are keeping its nutritional um, like content in terms of, if you rehydrate it in liquid, and keep that liquid, the water soluble vitamins remain in that liquid. And so that is the best way of maintaining the nutritional content. Um, and the other things, are, they're either maintained or there's, there's, there's very little impact. Um, the biggest problem we had was the combination were infinite. Stews, risotto, pasta sauces, soups, you know, you just keep going and keep going and we got a little bit lost in it. So. This is Dennis, that's what we named our dehydrator and Edinburgh Cyrenians who have been like sort of following us on a little bit of this. I think you called yours Dora, haven't you? So dehydrators obviously need to have names that begin with D is the uh, way forwards with this. Um, ours is a three chamber one and it's um, got, that means that the different bits that you can sort of see in the picture there can be run with different products. So it does allow you on one plugin to be dehydrating lots of different vegetables. So I would just mention that that's quite a useful feature. Okay, time. It's not speedy and you go, it's a little bit like compost. It makes you realize how much of fruit and veg is actually water. You go from a lot, a lot of food to not very much food. 
However, the thing, the food that you're creating then has a very long shelf life. So, you know, and when you rehydrate it, it bolts back up again. So although the dehydrated product doesn't look very big, it goes a long way. Um, the other important piece of kit that you need is to um, have a water activity meter. This is basically what you need to ensure that your dried product is within a safe range of, dry, of, of um, dehydration and that it won't go moldy or go off. So as you'll see, the dehydrator is about 3,000 pounds. The water meter is about 250. So if you're looking at capital fundraising, by the time you've done vacuum sealers, tray liners, chopping boards, you know, whatever, you're looking at about 4,000 pounds upfront investment if you want to be able to do this project. As I mentioned in the kind of handover, it is labor intensive. What we used is something we call chop and chats. And these are volunteer sessions to help people to chop, blow the dehydrator, fill the packs. Um, it's a friendly social space and it's a follow on option for some of our trainees. If you don't have that connection to groups of people, then you may be thinking very carefully about how much time this takes. Um, we did a lot of testing and trials. Um, we, for example, we tried it both as a meal. So our, our, what we do with ours at the moment is we make what we call flavor packs. And that's these different combinations that go in to a single bag for a family. And we have an Asian broth mix. We have a soup mix. We have a um, sort of summer vegetable puttanesca um, courgette mix. And I suppose the feedback from our testings and trials was that the contents became simpler because our projects were designed by chefs and cooks, they got a bit overexcited and made quite complicated um, packs. And actually people just wanted something simple they could add to pasta or, you know, something that was a little bit more, you know, three or four vegetables, which is great because it makes them quicker to make. Um, size of packs, people wanted bigger packs for larger families, as well as smaller packs for single households. We, inc we added low energy cookery instructions because they work really well in slow cookers um, and they can work in microwaves. And um, we also started to look at single items for meal projects. So rather than just making these in, into these meal kits, that actually you could just have a whole great big bag full of something if you were a community meal project. Um, as you say, each pack contains 1.2 kilograms of fresh vegetables, but it's a tiny, tiny thing by the time it gets there. Um, we did work out some um, costs. It'll depend massively on your energy prices as to what it costs to make them. Um, in terms of packaging, I'm just, you know, again, this is very much for us because we've turned them into these kits that people can take home themselves. Recycle package or not recycle packaging. Um, we in Brighton and Hove can't, our, our domestic waste collection doesn't take compostable packaging and treat it properly. So in the end, we went with a non-compostable option. It feels it feels a bit of a an icky part of the system, if I'm honest. We're really interested in the idea, perhaps, of doing more of a scoop and way type approach to it in future. Um, allergens and batch codes, which has already been mentioned. Um, again, Ready Healthy Eat has some amazing guidance about all of these topics, and we'll make sure that the links get shared to those afterwards. And the last thing is, is we call them flavor packs right, which the challenge is, is they actually don't necessarily have a lot of flavor themselves because you need to add, be it chili powder or you need to add herbs and spices. We can't put them in the kits because they have a different stabilization point. And so we would have to have gone through a whole nother layer of food safety and food checks if we wanted to try and include um, herb and spices packs, spices, sorry, particularly packs, herbs you can do but the spices packs would have to be kept differently so that was a slightly tricky thing although our very creative chefs have come up with the idea maybe of trying to do a um like a, almost like a leather a fruit leather type thing with some lemon and herbs in it that goes in the pack as well as a way of adding flavor but that's a future development for us um there are lots and lots of things to consider um i've already talked about some of them the um thing I'm going to say is my absolute recommendation for this is if you're going to dehydrate, get your dehydrator as close as possible to the source of the surplus. We are not. We're basically, we're doing ours in a kitchen, which means that actually we we have an extra level of um, delivery and that we have to get the surplus to us in our community kitchen. 
that's great because it means we've got lots of volunteers but I think the way you really want to be reusing this is to be able to say actually there's these carrots that that big crateful hasn't gone out through redistribution let's dehydrate it and then do something else with it rather than having to get that carrots to us by which point more have been spoiled um I think it's important to think about the consumers and what they want to like and what they want to see. We've deliberately made our packs really attractive so that people want to pick them up. The feedback that Libby gets when she goes to the affordable food projects is that, well, this looks like such a nice product. And I think that's really important. Food safety processes, this is, you are food processing. We had a really good support of our environmental health officer team. You know, you have to be registered as a food business. I guess it's really important just to think about those steps when you're doing this. At the moment, we don't sell our product because um, it has got surplus food in it, which was given for a particular reason, which was for um, alleviating poverty. And we feel at the moment that that product needs to be going to people in need because there is a massive shortage of fruit and veg going out through affordable food projects in Brighton and, and food banks in Brighton and Hove at the moment. Um, lots of people have suggested that we should sell it to make, make money for the project overall there are i think some ethical questions to be had and some details to be worked out in that um i just wanted to also give you and as i say we will share all of these some other sources of inspiration sussex surplus are on there with their autoclave sterilization um in france there's panier de la mer who um do fish soups and frozen burgers they're by a coast and they get a lot of fish um to, to process and um there's a dutch project called the waste factory um as I say, the last thing to say is if you want the dehydration guide, which will be ready to come out in early Feb, um, I'll put it in the chat as well. Please get in touch with uh, Libby, who are the food partnership. So um, that is my introduction to the, um, the... Right, okay, there's some questions coming in in the um, um, chat thing. I'm... What I'm going to actually get people to do now is, um, Libby, if you could just tell me if there's any questions from the chat that you've noticed that you think we should just deal with straight away. And if not, if you've got questions, either put your hand up and I'll come to you and you can put your microphone off when we have it. Put some ch ch questions in the chat. I'm really happy that this is discussion as well. So even just thoughts and reflections, because we're quite interested in where we go next with this as to whether the community sector wants to do more of this type of processing work whether you think actually it's more trouble than it's worth um because i think all of that is really interesting for jade too um i see there's a what is the shelf life of each pack question libby six months is it Twelve um months? we i th think we say about a year but as soon yeah. as it's opened it's about 10 days because obviously the air and moisture potentially goes in and when we store, I didn't say when we actually once once you've stored once we've dehydrated batches of the product, we vac seal store it because then it becomes stable again. The minute you open that bag, you start your date again in terms of how long it is since it was last processed. Bryn. So there was a question for us about um, whether our project is self financing um, and the cost of production. This is this is actually one of our challenges at the moment so um yes it is um up to the point that we um as as nick referred to the we meet um our costs when we're selling at retail price but we're actually struggling to sell at a wholesale price that people will want to pay for so it's become a limit to the scale of the project um there's quite a lot of further things i, I would back up your point entirely Vic about it being entirely to do with the the local um local conditions of your premises so we've got some real advantages with our premises in that um we've got a big retail market on our doorstep and uh, we've also um paying less for it than an industrial unit um on the other hand it's not configured well at all um, to scale up and we do a lot of double handling which is is bad for people's backs as well as uh, taking a ridiculous amount of time so our challenge is now uh, we want to scale up um, it's where to invest money uh, to uh, change our equipment to be able to uh, reduce our costs of sales for similar levels of labor input 
Thanks. Has anybody Thank else got sorry. a question they want to ask? Uh, Jade. Yeah, it's just a follow on for uh, Nick or Bryn. I, I'm wondering whether this, um, whether juicing is something we should be replicating around the country or whether the way that it works there is so particular to the advantages you've got that it's not worth investing and sharing it more generally. Should other areas be doing what you're doing? Does it stuck up all right? Yes. That's the <laughs> I mean, it, I, I, it's it's down to all those particulars, but I don't see why other people shouldn't have other um, other similar scenarios. That for those who don't know Stanmore Park, as Nick says, it's a, it's a it's a weekend destination for people to go for walks and walk their dogs, and we're using an old agricultural building, so we mostly work at weekends and juice outside. So it's a good way of engaging the public, um, which has upsides and downsides we end up talking to people quite a bit but it also means that we do have the um the ready market on the doorstep and as well as having a educational role as well so but it's not an exceptional you know the premises aren't exceptional in that circum in that respect either and i'm just wondering whether it's the kind of thing that needs to happen also at the, the top of the surplus food distribution chain whether fair share ought to be juicing that, that you know when it gets a load of stuff in on, on a bigger scale you got any feel about that whether it's worth what? doing it at scale and then distributing juice out to the well people system? people already do it commercially at scale and mm. i think one of our advantages is that we're going out and getting a third to our half of our fruit is we're going out and collecting it ourselves from places that certainly wouldn't be diverted into larger scale operations. And um, we're definitely effectively using volunteers to help collect that. Um, the other half to two thirds of our fruit is reject fruit from a commercial orchard, as Nick said. And that, um, at least some of that, if not all, uh, a large portion of that, would probably end up in a different commercial um, producer um, locally if we didn't take it so but that's not for sure some years there's more than they can deal with and some years there isn't um natasha do you want to say what you've just put in the chat because i think it's i think what's quite interesting is quite a lot of places across the country might have small scale orchards that they're interested in doing this sort of work on. yeah sorry um i did i pressed uh return before i meant to but Mainly, I just wanted to share that there are juicing operations in rural places uh, where there are orchards where actually they'll take any scale, like they'll take one small crate of apples and juice it for you um, because they're juicing everyone's apples far and near. Um, and so, you know, if you can, if you have a volunteer people power, to do the collection and delivery and you can sell at over the bottling rate then yes obviously that that surplus should be being juiced especially when it's grade you know they'll you're juicing grade b's that are not going to be sold as grade a's so it will otherwise just be composted or wasted um and the facilities you know you don't necessarily have to set up an organization that that needs that buys its own juicer and crusher and everything those facilities are out there if you if you have a little look anybody else got any um questions comments or thoughts that they want to add at this point um i've noticed that nick's put one for me uh, the water extracted from the dehydrator isn't really extracted as such in that it just disappears into the ether as smells and steam um <laughs> it, the thing i and actually that is something that's worth noting about the dehydrator in terms of its location is that it's not an unpleasant smell unless you're doing cabbage in which case it smells a little bit like school dining hall or swede twisted. or swede apparently <laughs> says the first we've had some complaints about the swede smells <laughs> <laughs> um Again, it's um, I suppose the thing to say for us on this is that I the dehydrator that's based in our community kitchen is probably not the best place for it because it's 
our, that is a cookery school space. It's a space where we run um, all sorts of different like cookery lessons and activities. Um, it was just because we were trialing the project there. So yeah, I think that um, if you were going to dehydrate, and actually, I don't know if um, Sue or Emma, you want to just quickly say anything about what's going on at Cyrenians with because with um, how you're working for you, for people's information, they are a fair share. Yep, yeah, Sue's just snipped away. Um, so we've been got the dehydrator up and running for probably three months now. Um, and we are really fully reliant upon our volunteers because otherwise it would just be myself doing the preparing, chopping and dehydrating. But we are fully reliant on fair share. So anything can come in on any day. And we run classes twice a week at the moment, um, doing the chop and chat sessions. Everyone's been really enjoying it. Um, but like you were saying earlier, Vic, it's then what do we do with all the produce? So we've been at the moment giving things um, out to our class participants that's come through the council classes. Um, yeah. Thanks. Because and in terms of the logistics, because obviously you again have got yours you got yours in a, a separate cupboard or something ours, ours is out in a garage yeah we've got a second makeshift um kitchen out in the garage with our stainless steel work surfaces yeah yeah um and so i suppose that whole the questions of sort of who is the produce going to yeah where is it being processed but also where's the produce coming from i mean in a way it doesn't matter what processing you're doing whether you're making meals whether you're redistributing the produce as fresh produce these are the same questions that we're all dealing with across the sector um jade has got a suggestion is, is there somebody from fair share apart from emma that has w could comment on whether or not this would work at a bigger scale no Hey Jade, I'm not sure what your uh, comment was there. Um, Jade has also asked that we just perhaps touch a little bit more on the what we call the chop and chat model. And I will also use that as a chance to answer the question about how many paid staff we have involved with our project. Because we have been running our chop and chat sessions, which, as I say, are social volunteer opportunities for people who've been on one of our community cookery courses, so people who have either got a mental health issue, a physical health issue, or have come to learn skills as a sort of follow-on option, because people tend to come on like five-week courses and then want to keep doing things with us. Now, those sessions have um, got funding from grant sources to cover the member of staff that is involved in running those sessions. So in a way that there is that person and those take place at the moment between once and twice a month um, as an afternoon. And then we have also had Libby through the Ready Healthy Eat project working on helping to distribute and get the packs out there to make sure they're working. So I would say the, the challenge you'll have if you wanted to have paid staff on the dehydration project is that actually you need it really, really spread thinly over time because you basically need someone to supervise the chop and chats. You then need somebody to supervise to make sure that the when it comes the produce comes out and gets bagged and labeled that all that is being done like safely and properly. The actual individual time with each task isn't so huge in that um the the packing sessions, what do they take? About half a day usually to do um a few Libby? <laughs> um it depends how much it is, but it takes about an hour and a half to empty the dehydrator and to uh, clean all the trays. And then, yeah, coming out of that depends what you're sort of putting together. But yeah, all in all, it's about half a day's worth to unpack and to make, unload and make the packs. Um, has anybody else got anything that they'd like to add at this point? As I say, our, our next steps are going to be to put the recording of this session out through... Oh, hang on, Bryn, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I was just noticing in the chat, someone was asking how many people were working for both projects. Um, oh, yes. I can't see it now, but I saw it. Um, for us, Nick, it's about... I think it's about one and a half 
people full time equivalents, possibly through the season, something like that. We've got three to four members of the team regularly. But, um, do you I'm want to, to say something about the logistics of of backing backing all that lot up as well, because that might be of interest to people. Um, how we schedule it um, and the logistics of getting it all working. Are you aiming that at me, Bryn? Sorry. Well, I can. I was just trying to share share the. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I'll jump in. Um, so, as Bryn mentioned, we do most of our production over the weekend. Um, and we'll always have one member of staff at the least um, there. But our new model for when we're trying to produce a bit more and therefore come up with a more competitive cost is it's quite an our, our day structure. Um, basically, one member will go in at 7.30 in the morning and be juicing and pressing when they then hand over to the second person in the team um well at about 11 o'clock but then there's like a basically 7 30 till 11 there's one person a member of um the second member will come in at 11 and a volunteer all being well and then the day will go through till four um, when we close the shop and then it might go on till five if they're still cleaning up cleaning up to do um but we are yeah, we are dependent on volunteers and it, sometimes, yeah, the chat time can actually take over from the production time. Um, and we're also very vulnerable to weather because we do everything. Well, we do half of the production outside. So it, it is all a bit of a, it's not a clear cut answer to that. Um, but just to tidy up that, so we juice over the weekends. We then spend one day, maximum two days during the week, finishing the pasteurizing process and the bottling and the labeling, which is done by a paid member of the team um, plus a volunteer. So effectively, you've got Saturday, Sunday with two members of the team paid plus volunteers, and then Wednesday with of finishing the process with a paid member of the team and a and a volunteer. I guess the thing that strikes me is that whatever your processes are, and I think this is the thing we've massively you know learned doing this, is that it's been really having them really clearly written down as to what is involved at each step. So and being really clear, you know, if you're the person who is responsible for doing the water meter checks, all of that information, you know I mean, whatever the steps are, that that is labelled. We, as a social organisation, aren't here to try and make a food product that's going to be the most financially viable, you know, it's like it's going to make us loads of money. You know, we're not Coca-Cola, basically. But what so what we're trying to do is use food to also create some of this social good. And this idea, and I'm, I'm totally with you, Nick, because sometimes you want to say to the chop and chatters, oi, 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 less chat, more chop, right? <laughs> um, but that isn't really about what the, the process is about. And so it's that having organisations that are able to hold both. But I think it'd be fair to say what's really important to people who come to along to the chop and chats, and I know to the juicing as well, because I hear people who've been along to it, is being part of creating a product that is actually valued and finished. And it's not that you're just doing something for the sake of it. You are creating something that is going on to either you know be sold in the case of the juicing project or have uh, value in terms of feeding somebody else in a really nice way in the case of the dehydration project and I think if we're if you're doing this as a social organization you have to be very willing and very confident about actually explaining both sides of it because um, the drive for efficiency is probably not ever going to mean that you're with us. <laughs> Um, can I just add something on on that and to, to to further what you said about seeing the process all the way through for, for anyone who is thinking about a juicing operation themselves in the way that we do it with volunteers our location is very valuable to us because they do get to be involved in that sales process as well and it's not just sort of making a product and sticking it on a shelf and 
then it's someone else's department to to sell that so it really is it's kind of full circle and yeah just echoing what you said there Vicky I think that really does add add value for our volunteers so a last chance for any questions or comments from people um I hope this has been a useful little insight into some of the things we've been um doing uh trying down here on the south coast um as I say, I will make sure that uh, Bryn's, sorry, that um, Phil's presentation is also shared because actually if you're involved with gleaning and you're involved in pumpkins and courgettes at large scale, I think some of the processes that they've tried with their soup making and bottling is really, really interesting as well. Um, Jade. I was just wondering whether some of the people on the call might be thinking of trying either juicing or dehydrating themselves. And in that case, whether they might like to share their contact details so that they can keep in touch with uh, what's not working and what is working and recipes and all the rest of it. Would each other? You probably don't have permission to share them, Vic. I guess you've got them. But you're probably um, not allowed to share them. We What we can do is, uh, Libby, if we send out a message to everybody who was booked on, just explaining where the links are to the recording, because some people who've booked haven't been able to come, and slides and things, which will be on the Real Farming Trust. And I think in that, probably just do an invite for anybody who wants to stay in touch to share details back again. I mean, I, I recognise an awful lot of you on this group, so I know that we've got um, kind of contacts for people anyway. I, it's, I think it's for me as well, for the Sustainable Food Places Network, it's kind of probably one of those themes that's quite interesting. We've got, if you're not already part of that network, it's got its own email list and things that goes on. And I, Ian is a fantastic contributor. Um, I've always like really, you know, it's always quite a good thing to share questions and ask questions on there because people can help. For those of you that don't already joined up, just go to the Sustainable Food Places website to find out more. Um, thank you, everybody. It's been really nice to see you. and. Uh, I will uh, see you all soon, no doubt. Thank you. Thanks particularly Nick and Bryn for doing the presentation. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Vic. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>